Hi, I am Pam Savino, and I would like to welcome you to the Live Authentically Show. My team and I help people step into their authentic realities via a number of different modalities. This podcast is one of them. And also, we have a Facebook community where we have a like-minded group of individuals committed to spiritual growth and transformation. You can find us at liveauthentically.today slash FB. On today's show, I'm super excited to have with us two very special guests. Their names are Pam Stewart and Iona Monk. They are friends and colleagues and have a podcast together called Relationship Dish. So I would like to welcome you both to the show. Thank you, Pam. Thank you so much for being here. I know you're super busy and I'm super um, honored that you have chosen to spend some of your day with me. So thank you. Thank you. Um, I always start the show off for all of my guests, regardless of their background, um, with the same question. And that question, I would love for you both to answer it individually. And that question is a question that's very near and dear to my heart, this concept of living authentically. So what does it mean to you to live authentically every day? That's a very good question. (laughs) You're looking at me. You want me to start, don't you? (laughs) <laughs> I authentically, I'm going to live authentically and I'm going to say yes. I want you to start. Tell me that you can. <laughs> I love that. First. Um, well, I, I feel. I, I think the word that comes up for me is just living honestly. So trying to be very aware of, of being in the moment, which happens for milliseconds at a time. Um, And also, I think just always looking at a situation and asking myself the question, you know, what's really going on here for me in terms of, is there something unconscious that's happening that I'm not aware of, or did I overreact to something or did I underreact or, um, so, you know, Iona and I call ourselves really psychologically minded people. And so I'm, I, I kind of live in this, um, in this world where I'm always kind of looking at what I'm doing and why I'm doing it and trying to be as honest with myself and with others as I can. That's a great answer. That's a great answer. Thank you. And Iona, how would you respond to that question? I'll let you go first because now I have your answer was too good. (laughs) So I think for me, because I work primarily as a couples therapist, um, what's really honest and authentic to me is um, walking my talk. So again, because I work as a couples therapist and I teach um, not just communication, but attachment and safe connection. Um, Mm -hmm. I try to live that myself with the people that I care about the most. So I try it with my husband, with my daughter, with my friends. I try to be as connected to them as possible. I try to be as intimate and honest with them as possible. Um, I'm all about, you know, unearthing stuff. I don't like anything growing between me and the, my primary relationship. So I think it's basically walking my talk. It's, it's living the life that I teach my clients to live, which is having intimacy and connection and attachment. And again, similar to what Pam was saying, looking at the ways I potentially sabotage it and trying to be as honest with myself as possible without letting my defenses and my projections get the best of me about what's really going on for me and how I'm really feeling in this intimate connection. And I think for both of us, Pamela, the word vulnerability comes up big because living authentically and living honestly does require vulnerability. And most of us don't like that very much. (laughs) Right. But we, but we don't admit that we don't like no. it. That's the thing. So admitting, owning, realizing consciously what your blocks are and where your, you know, raw tender spots are, like you're saying, vulnerability is a very big one. Mm-hmm. And so we mindfully step into or try to step into those vulnerable places and grow as much as we can as people in that way, despite how every part of us might, might be screaming to do the opposite, <laughs> right? And not open up and not be vulnerable and stay angry or have that wall up. Uh, We try to move toward the things I think that frighten us the most. Yes, I would say that that's a really good In our relationships. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I would love to dive in really deep on the topic of vulnerability throughout this podcast. Because I do, and that is such a huge key. I know I've discovered through my process 
huge key to growth and transformation. I mean, that's what causes us all to open up and look at our lives through the lens of growth. And I know for me, I, you know, you talked about, um, you know, owning it. And I think for me too, I wasn't even aware. I got married really, really young. You know, I wasn't even aware in my early twenties that vulnerability was a necessary component in a relationship. I kind of went through that whole checklist of, yes, I said, we, you know, this relationship seems to satisfy all of these criteria. Yes, he's yeah. tall. Yes, he's good looking. Right. Exactly. It comes from a good family, is, you know, career focus, et cetera. We thought we had all those boxes checked. And I never even realized, and I don't want to speak for him, but I think as a couple, we didn't make a commitment to vulnerability because I wasn't even aware that that was a necessary ingredient, ingredient to intimacy, emotional intimacy, and really such an important piece of the puzzle. So I would love to dive into that much further because I think this is just, this is an area that just, that puts this whole, you know, the relationships in a whole new light. Um, but what I would love to do before we dive into that really deep, I'd love to talk about your history and how you guys, how you came together, how you decided to do a podcast, maybe each of your respective backgrounds, because I think that obviously all of our experiences, all of our human experiences, play a key role in making us who we are. So rather than just looking at where we are today and moving forward, I'd love to hear, you know, were there some life experiences that prompted you to embark on this career path, et cetera. So maybe you can each individually walk me through your chronology, your history, and how you both came together today. Okay. Well, I guess I could start this you one. You could start this time. <laughs> We're like a married couple. <laughs> she is, she's my wife. She's my work wife, right? Yeah. Um, don't tell my husband I said that, though. Uh, he knows. He knows, yeah. He's happy that she's my work wife. This way he doesn't have to deal with a lot of the psychological stuff. Um, so for me, um, I was always interested in psychology, always, always as a kid. I think um, from the time I was about eight years old, if you asked me what I wanted to be, I would say, I want to be a couples therapist, which was extremely odd for an eight-year-old. Really? Totally. Oh, I didn't, I didn't know, know that. No. Yeah, I guess because my, you know, living in my house, my parents, there wasn't much harmony in my house, <laughs> to okay. put it and so I, you know, my parents would each sort of come to me for advice and stuff like that, and so I stepped into that role involuntarily from a very young age. Oh, nice. Yeah, but nevertheless, was always super, super interested in the brain and the and how it worked and 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 relationships and people and how we are with others, and so I. Um, I did my undergrad uh, degree at McGill in psychology way, way back in the day. I won't say when. Mm -hmm. And then um, sort of took a break and, and then years later went back and did my master's degree at, at University of British Columbia in counseling psychology, where I was lucky enough to meet, to meet Pam. And we ended up in the same clinic, um, which is a sort of very intensive course where they actually just throw you into counseling people right away. And, and well, well, everybody else watches you through a two-way mirror. Yeah. Talk about vulnerability. Totally. Totally. I mean, the, cl the clients know what's happening because they're typically they can't pay for regular counseling, so they agree to see students who are learning. So you know, everybody knows what's going on. But so you're in there counseling someone with all your colleagues watching you through a two-way mirror, and so it's sort of a, an interesting environment. And we were in the same clinic, okay. and I just. You know, I don't know. I think it was love at first sight. I watched Pam work and I couldn't, she just did some, these really cool, really creative techniques with this one particular couple she was working with. And I was just like, oh my God, I was smitten. I said, oh my God, this woman's amazing. I was just so drawn to her. And since then, we've just been really good friends mm -hmm. and our friendship has grown over the years. And a couple of years ago, um, so we would have, you know, like friends do, we'd have coffee every few months. Or a glass of wine. Yes. And where we just get together and you know what it's like, you just blah, you just talk about everything, talk about everything. And that's when you said, you said, Pam, you know I can't be friends with you anymore. No, that was a different conversation. <laughs> I said, what did I say? You Let's... said, I'm tired. I need to do something creative. Right. I want to do a podcast. Right. And I said, it's me. I'll do it with you. <laughs> And it was, and, and so it was perfect. So for the past, I don't know, two years plus, yeah. we've been doing the podcast and we're both very, very passionate. Luckily, we're both very passionate about the same um, topics in, in psychology because, I mean, it's a very broad field, but the same stuff interests us, attachment and connection and intimacy 
and defenses and projections stuff like it's that. Just, so. It's just it's it's consciousness. It's about consciousness in a relationship. That's yeah, really what it is. Yeah. So that's my story. Okay. What's your story? Well, so <laughs> my story is is that I started out as a as a speech pathologist because mm -hmm. I really liked science and I liked working with kids. And then the more I did that, the more interested I became in the family dynamics because usually the child had some kind of a disability, which is very difficult for the family. So I was really drawn to family dynamics and that's why I went to University of British Columbia for um, a second graduate degree. And I, so my real area of interest is working with parents around their early experiences being a parent as their child attaches to them. And if you look at, if you look at consciousness, the first, the prototype for our relationships is our early relationships with our parents, mm -hmm. uh, or our caregivers. And so I just am so wanting to be so protective of those relationships and support young families for those relationships to grow in as healthy a way as possible. So I, you know, I don't, I, I've certainly worked with couples in the context of families, but it's Iona has the, the couples counseling expertise and mine is more around that early attachment experience and how that manifests as we, as we grow and evolve. Okay, great. And so do you actually, do you coach families? That like, do you coach family units? How does your, how do, how do you... Yeah, I mean, I just had a session the other evening with a couple. So the baby was there for a while. And then one of the parents put the baby to bed and then we continued. So, um, yeah. Yeah. And sometimes I do it with older kids too, but most of my work is really with the parent because mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I, it's their awareness and their involvement that needs to take place as part of the process. And it is such a fascinating process. I mean, I, when um, my former husband and I were, trying to decide what direction we would take our marriage. You know, we were in counseling for a handful of months and it is just an absolutely fascinating process and fascinating exercise to look at certain patterns and, and be able to trace them back to early childhood experiences. And it's, I never even realized until, you know, until this process, how much of an imprint our early caregivers make on us. I mean, obviously I knew they contributed to my life in a huge way, came from a you know, a very kind, loving, nurturing family, but I never dissected that further and understood, truly understood how certain characteristics and traits of my parents and certain behaviors helped to mold me and shape me and, and really, you know, it had a huge impact on my human experience, such as types of people I attracted, certain patterns I was perpetuating, things like that. So it was really eye-opening and there was a huge self-discovery component of the sessions, which I found to be fascinating. Um, I'd love to talk more about your podcast. I'd love to hear more about who, what, what type of guests you have maybe, and what is your goal with the podcast? What is your main objective with having this podcast? Well, I'm going to use the word vulnerability again, because basically Iona and I go into, and unless we have a guest, most of our episodes are just the two of us okay. and we, we will, um, dish on something that's happening in our own lives and our own relationships in the service of then bringing up an issue which we can share with listeners and then go into the literature. So we really do render ourselves to be vulnerable um, and that's intentional. Yeah, yeah. We, we don't, we don't mm -hmm. see ourselves as kind of quote unquote advice givers. We're not out there to look like the model of the perfect relationship. We're actually there to look you know, a little bit messy and, and then to talk about how we're muscling through it. And, and also to always, always we bring in some um, professional literature to either to support what we're, we're discussing. And I mean, I think another goal of the podcast is to destigmatize um, couples counseling, because I mean, in my practice, uh, and, and there's some research out there that, that says that on average, and this is fascinating, couples show up in counseling seven years too late. Mm -hmm. Seven years too late, right? Imagine if you had a tooth that was hurting you for seven years. You finally go to the dentist. You think the dentist is going to be able to save the tooth? Probably not, right? 
And right. so, and so I learned that there's such a stigma in, in, in admitting that you're having issues and, and, and complexities in your relationship. And I mean, you know, Pam, we all come from family of origins that some, you know, that, that, that aren't perfect. Right. And where we, where some really negative stuff gets imprinted on us or some really unhealthy coping or, or communication styles. I mean, none of our parents were communicating in these, you know, um, in these sophisticated and clean and healthy ways. And I don't know about your family, but I didn't see that very much between my parents. So then, you know, fast forward 30 years and then you have to make a relationship work with someone else and you don't have the tools to do that because you've never been taught what that looks like. And so that's very normal. But people feel so such a stigma around coming to counseling. They feel shame. They feel, you know, they'll, they'll sit there and they'll say, you know, we should be able to figure this out ourselves. And I always say the same thing to them, which is kind of goofy. But I always say, oh, and do you fix your own teeth too? And, and do you, you know, give yourself shots to Like, people need to stop seeing uh, healthy relationships as something that should be easy or just should be or shouldn't take work. Should, should, should. It, it shames people into believing that getting help is wrong mm -hmm. and it keeps people locked in then these dysfunctional patterns that ultimately end in divorce. And, and, and I think that's why the divorce rate is so high. Forget the divorce rate. Look at the dissatisfaction rate. Like if, if, when I think about, not my practice, obviously, because it's biased because nobody's happy who's coming to see me. But when I even look around at my friends, at my colleagues, at, at the world around me, I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, ballpark it at about between five and 10% of couples are truly happily married or happily together. Actually, ask you if you yeah, really shockingly though. So, so for, it's for this reason that we do the podcast is to help people go, oh, you're a therapist and you have problems. Oh, maybe it's okay to have problems, you know? So that's certainly one goal. And the other goal is to teach people how to, if you can't afford counseling or you're not ready to come to counseling, here are some tools you can use if you're struggling with this problem as well. Here are some books you can read. Here's an article on it. Here's what it might be about. Here's how you can look inside of yourself and, and improve on this. So, yeah, I think that's sort of the second part of our, yeah, our goal. Try and be provocative mm -hmm. to provoke interest and, um, and action. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. And I love, I love that you're doing it in such a vulnerable, authentic way. And that's, that's what authenticity is, right? That's what it's putting it all out there. The good, the bad, the ugly, the messy. I mean, relationships are hard. They're complicated. They're messy. Yes. And I, sometimes we do try to put on this image of, you know, putting out the Christmas card that it's, you know, has color coordinated outfits and, oh, look, we try <laughs> to think that like, oh, we need to make, make this look easier. We need to make it look like, you know, we're, we're doing this, you know, doing this right or it's easy, but it's not, you know, it's, at least for me, it's really, even when things, we're going well. It's still work. It's still really hard. So I too am on a mission to destigmatize a lot of the, the notions around and the beliefs around therapy. I am actually pro therapy. Even in my book, there's a little section where I say, I'm going to take this opportunity to do a little commercial for therapy. I firmly believe that everyone should have a therapist kind of in their toolkit at their disposal, you know, yeah. to access them at all times, because even outside of relationships, Life is messy. Life is complicated. Life is unpredictable. Life is a series of, of changes, some of which are brought on by us, which can still be stressful, and some of which are not. Some are unexpected changes. And I think that, you know, we, we as a society aren't afraid to talk about, oh, I have a personal trainer, or, oh, I have a nutritionist. Here are all the, the people they tell, you know, here are the people that, and talk openly, you know, here are the people that help me with my physical well-being. But nobody wants to talk about the mental well-being, and that's another pillar that is necessary in order to keep our well-being you know, flourishing and alive. So I too wholeheartedly agree with you that I think we need to destigmatize a lot of the ideas and notions and beliefs around therapy, because to me, it doesn't necessarily mean that something is wrong. I think that people can enter therapy in order to, to give them extra tools to deal with life or to prevent certain situations. Or I I'm like next time, you know, when I'm in a, you know, a relationship that appears to be, you know, my, my forever relationship, I intended to be my forever relationship. I'm going to throw out, Hey, Hey, like as a date night, let's like, let's start off by going to therapy. I know I'm going to be looked at, you know, I'm going to be, that's not going to may not be received well, but I am so pro let's do more self-discovery. Therapy doesn't always necessarily need to mean that there are issues or that there are things that need to be worked out. View it as self-discovery. View it as, Hey, let's learn more about each other in a very, 
vulnerable, open, honest way. Because, you know, therapists are just so, I had an amazing therapist when we were going through couples therapy. And I also continued with her through, throughout my divorce process. And just amazing. She was amazing at helping me discover certain aspects of myself that I never even knew were there. And she gave me an opportunity to highlight more areas of my, my unconscious, make, make myself more aware of them, to bring them into my conscious. So this whole process, this whole process of therapy has really cracked open a part of my psyche that I didn't even realize really needed to be cracked open. Beautiful and, and lucky that you had such a great therapist. Yeah, and such a good experience. Um, you know, I, I'm taken by the word you used. You talked about a toolbox. And um, so this family that I was seeing last week, we did a little exercise. We were looking at their what we call their support matrix, which okay. is, you know, what what are the and you know clearly they each other was their greatest support. But then what other things are in your support matrix, as opposed to this idea of well we just need to do it all on our own. And one of the things that was in their support matrix was was having a therapeutic relationship. And so whether they access that weekly or monthly or in crisis, how, however they choose to do it, is, is part of the, a tool in their toolbox. Right. Yeah. Right. And I think that part of destigmatizing this is helping people understand that you're making an investment in yourself rather than viewing it as, you know, a negative, viewing it as this is something I'm doing to invest in my overall well-being. And that that includes physical well-being, mental well-being, emotional well-being, spiritual well-being. And I think it's just an idea, it's, it's just a, a, more of a, um, what do I want to call it? More of a process of helping them rewire their mindset or their, their, their mindset around that, I guess is the way that I would say it. And you love that word investment. I do. I do love the <laughs> word investment. I think it's like a bank account. Um, you know, the more you uh, invest in your relationship, the more money in the bank. Um, and the less likely you are to go into overdraft yes. when problems happen. Right, because sure, there's going to be arguments and there's going to be tension and there's going to be disagreements that are going to draw down your account. Right. But, um, so there, has, there definitely has to be money in the bank. And the other thing that comes up for me is the idea that there's how, look at how many of us, I, I'm in a second marriage. And the idea that going from one marriage into another is going to somehow be so much better is, is another myth. But whatever it was you had to work through in the first marriage, you, you know, that were your issues, you're going to have to address them in your second. Mm -hmm. Right. And the statistics for divorce go up with each succession, you know, each marriage, right? Is that yeah. true? Okay. They do. Yeah. yeah. Totally. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. We just we just unsettled Pam. <laughs> oh, no, I didn't I didn't mean to, but I just no no we knew we knew I'm joking. <laughs> I just part of that though that those same patterns are perpetuated unless you take time to do that deep work after the relationship breakdown that you're just carrying the same relationship patterns to the next. Sure. And you're you're you know and I say this from experience, but I see it with um, people I've worked with. Your new partner may trigger different things in you than in your past marriage. So not only are you still dealing with whatever old patterns you have, you may find there's some new ones coming out of the closet okay. with this new dynamic. I certainly found that. Yeah. And what did you learn about yourself in that process? I mean, when you, when you, were you, as a therapist, you probably were anticipating new triggers, but how could, could you speak a little bit about that maybe to the people who are in that second marriage, they thought, okay, this is it. This is this is my second time around. I know myself better. I'm going to do this better this time. And all of a sudden, they're caught off guard by these unanticipated triggers. Well, <laughs> I'm speechless for a moment, which is rare. Um, so I, I mean, I just found I had to continue. I had to continue to work on myself, Pam, because you know, a trigger, it's easy for me to say, oh, I'm upset because you did whatever. But I have to look at, well, what is it in me that is finding this so difficult? Mm -hmm. And is it, you know, is it some of my own process? Or do I actually need to set a boundary for, for you? 
Um, and so I think in this, in my second marriage, one thing I've really had to step up is my ability to just clearly set a boundary around whether it's a conversation or pushing a particular agenda or whatever. My, my second husband is very outgoing and he's very much a, um, an extrovert. And sometimes it's like kind of being run over by a Mack truck. And so I have to say just, no, 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 hang on, hang on. And so, and that was different than in my first marriage where boundary setting wasn't, wasn't, um, wasn't such an issue. Mm -hmm. so you just, you keep, you keep navigating it. And again, it's money in the bank. There's, and, and as I want to know, I mean, we, my second husband and I took 10 years to decide, well, I took 10 years to decide <laughs> to make a commitment as all my friends will go, yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> And I think it's so important too to just to stay so firmly affixed to growth, staying on that path of growth and asking yourself, you know, why is this triggering me? That's real that was a game changer for me when I realized that when I was being triggered, either within a relationship or outside of a relationship, that that was really an unhealed part of myself that needed to be healed. And that was an opportunity to look within. So I started paying really close attention to anything that elicited an emotional charge. And rather than looking to point the finger or blame. I took the opportunity to look within and ask myself, what can I learn from this? What is this trying to teach me? Why do I keep seeing this pattern over and over and over again? And it's amazing how just one by one, you can start just kind of going down that list and okay, healed, healed, healed. I mean, we always are constantly learning, but I did start to see certain patterns about what triggered me. And just, I, rather than reacting, I took time to just pause and think about how I would respond and once I was able to look at it through that lens of growth, my life started to change radically. Beautiful. I mean, that's, that's amazing to do. And I mean, who's more interesting than ourselves, right? Being curious about yourself instead of just pointing the finger and saying, oh, that's your fault. Saying, yeah, what's going on inside me? I mean, what more interesting puzzle is there than ourselves, right? You would think. Right, exactly. <laughs> Spoken like a true nerd. <laughs> <laughs> it is fascinating. Life is just so much sweeter. And, you know, you can experience the depth and richness of life when you go deep. Because there is no, there's no end. There's no, that well never gets dry. When you're on that, in that world of growth and learning about yourself, there's never a, a last thing that you learn. Or, oh, I accomplished that. And I think that that's the difference when you kind of, when you go, when you take that growth approach or when you, take a soul-based approach to living, which is making the unconscious conscious, et cetera, everything we're talking about. I think living from the ego, and I don't say it with any judgment, it kind of comes, we all have ego as a healthy part of us. And I think a lot of that is driven by societal conditioning, it conditions us to think that once we achieve that, you know, a certain status or a certain amount of money in the bank or a certain title or get that corner office or that car or that house or that bigger house, the list is endless. And I think we, we are just conditioned to think, oh, well, happiness is, will be when I achieve that. We yes. We illusion around that. And we never are fully satisfied, but we can't quite put our finger on why. So and, Yeah. Sorry, like happiness is a destination and right. not a journey, right? Exactly. Right. 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 Sure. What I found is, I mean, happiness, a happy life is, um, is constructed by a series of happy moments. So I no longer you know, think about, oh, how do I want to put this happy lunch in it? I don't think about that. Oh, that's not where I'm coming from. That's my, if you like, I can my, search the web for Siri, I said, I must have said something that triggered Siri here. My phone is on airplane mode. <laughs> 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 I must have said something. Hey, Siri. <laughs> <laughs> that's either <laughs> almost a series, of, series of happy moments, right? So now I just focus on, you mentioned living in the moment earlier. That's all it is. It's about what do I need to do to be happy and joyous and peaceful and grateful and all of these amazing feelings. And that's it. And just keep doing that over and over and over. I wanted to just say, because I think it's important for listeners to get this, when we accept responsibility for our triggers that we have, you know, issues to deal with, we, we really don't want to go into self-punishment um, or mm -hmm. to um, because that's very non-productive. And I, you know, I like what you were just saying about living, living consciously and in the moment and, and experiencing the joy and the happiness in each moment. It's, it's, I, I just 
don't want people to kind of swing over to, well, everything is my fault. If, if, if nothing is your fault, meaning I can no longer project on you, I don't want listeners to swing into then everything is my fault. Mm -hmm. right? so going into shame and self-blame as opposed to curiosity. I think curiosity is the, is the key. Yeah, is the key word here. Like, so that it's more like, hmm, this is interesting. What what is it that's going on for me? As opposed to, oh, I'm such a bad person that I'm. Well, well, that's a block to curiosity, right? Because the minute. Right. And, that, and quite honestly, what we know <clears throat> is that that's also a defense. Mm -hmm. it's just, you know, it's just a different look in defense. It's absolutely a defense. If, you know, this way you avoid feelings. And and I and if I could, I just want to say something about what you had said earlier about, you know, this vulnerability piece and and not realizing in your early twenties that that's a thing, right? right. And, that, and that's such a big piece, Pam. I mean, vulnerability and a, and a slew of other stuff. You know, we go into our, our our relationships with our partners typically at some point in our twenties for most people, and I mean, none of us or very few of us in our twenties have our eye well first of all we don't have a crystal ball so we don't know what we don't know but but i mean i never thought of the word vulnerability until a few years ago and i'm like in my 50s so and a therapist so you know we learn as we go and i and i think with relationships given the fact that they typically start in your 20s and you don't know what you don't know um a lot of it is just good luck i think that you end up with someone who is wanting to grow in the same ways you are who is also discovering the same things you're discovering, who's right. interested in the same, you know, relationship growth through the decades as, as you are. And, and I know that's a weird thing to attribute it to, but, uh, but I think you're right. I don't think this is something we scream for or vet for in our twenties, because we're not even thinking those ways. We are thinking about, Oh, did he, did he or she graduate from a good university? Is he or she have a good family? Is he or she a kind person, which is all very, very important. Mm -hmm. But over the years, things shift and things change and those things become less important and or, or we take them for granted because they're a given and the growth of the relationship um, is what um, takes more of a primary focus. And you just got to hope, hope, you know, beyond hope that you're both interested in growing in the same ways. And yeah, yeah. and I, I, I do, I am chalking that up to luck. I, it's, you know, I know that's weird, but. I have to say that one of the things I'm most excited about in our podcast is how many young couples listen to us. And um, we, I've had several um, couples say to me that they, they listen, either they listen to the podcast together or they listen to it separately and then talk about it together. And so it, it again is a way of kind of increasing your love map of each other as they listen to us kind of bumble through our own our own difficulties and but there's a learning at the end of it that then they can can choose to explore so yeah, yeah i like that a lot and i love that mutuality that you spoke about with regard to couples coming to you together both committed to growth because that is obviously that's such a huge component of this notion of conscious relationship this new relationship paradigm where people are committed to growth as an individual committed to growth as a couple, committed to growth, you know, growth for humanity. It's just a very growth-centered model as compared to that old old relationship paradigm where, as, you know, maybe there were gender roles or everything was more compartmentalized. There wasn't that focus on growth. It was more about satisfying certain criteria. So I think that that is just such a healthy component of a relationship. And it's really, I think, just vital in order to sustain happiness and fulfillment in, in long-term relationships. For sure. And Pam, there was something before you said about a sort of just proactive counseling, right? As opposed to, you know, defensive counseling right. where you're reactive in, or reactive rather. Yeah. Reactive counseling where, you know, you're in serious trouble and you're having to get out of a mess versus going into counseling, wanting to make the relationship better, even if it's fine, wanting to make it better, wanting to make it um, you know, more uh, happy, wanting to make it more fulfilling, wanting to feel better in the relationship. That's a great reason to go to counseling. Unfortunately, you know, again, people don't show up at a doctor's office until they have a problem. Yes. Um, 
a symptom of a problem, right? And then by then it's often too late. Preventative medicine, you know, what do they say? An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Is that what they say? Mm -hmm. Something like that. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. do you find that you have, is it, if a couple comes to you, is it more the women, the woman who brings them? Or, or not. I don't want I, to stereotype that. Right. I'm Lately, I'm seeing kind of really more of a 50-50 where a lot of men are reaching out to me first and saying, my wife and I, or my girlfriend and I are having problems. And it's really, really um, great because typically it is women that will reach out more. But I see in my practice that just as many men initiate. And so I feel really optimistic about that. Mm -hmm. yeah. And young too i feel very optimistic about young couples coming to see me and i always tell them good for, they're like oh none of our friends need counseling and i say you, you don't know that many of them do and they're just not coming so i always say kudos to you for coming when before things go off the rails mm -hmm. right and that's a really good indication of of the health of the relationship i think right and i know for me on my journey <coughs> you talked about um you, you said seven years is how long people, people generally show up in counseling seven years too late, right? Did I remember that correctly? Is that what you said? And that's exactly how I describe my situation. You know, I describe it as therapy, our therapy was great, but it was too little too late. And we probably, you know, maybe if we had gone sooner, we wouldn't, have, wouldn't be in this position. But that rift, that disconnect just started to grow and magnify over time. And, you know, we were both in autopilot, just kind of doing what we thought we should be doing, thinking, oh, well, life will get easier once we get past the baby and toddler phase. And Life will get easier when we're done building this house or life will get easier when, but we never really, we never really realized that we needed to stop and figure out how to make it better or easier now. Exactly. So, but I think that can be really hard to recognize when you're in the throes of everyday life and taking care of you know, jobs and families and all everything that goes with managing a busy household. So what advice would you have for couples who say, you know, what barometers would you, would you, suggest they use for determining whether or not they might be a good candidate for therapy. Mm -hmm. um, those early barometers, you know, not waiting until, you know, there's the, you're in crisis mode, but what would be some early, early signs to watch for? Question. Um, so you want me to sort of, yeah, I, I, I think some early signs to watch for would be, um, I know this, is, this might be a bit controversial, but I do think in certain cases that sex is a good litmus test for the health of the relationship. Um, if you find that you're not, and, and again, sex goes up and down with kids and, and stress and life and, and health and that sort of thing. But in general, um, I think it's a pretty decent litmus test of the health of the relationship. If you're still wanting to be physical with each other, if you're still wanting to be vulnerable with each other, if, if, I think it's a litmus test of the amount of resentment. I know for me anyway, if I'm feeling resentful toward my husband for something, I don't want to have sex. You know what I mean? And so it is a litmus test that tells me if I feel close and connected with him and we may not be able to, you know, logistically, my daughter might, you know, whatever might be going on in the house, but my desire for him, I think is a, is a D. So I think one's desire for their partner is a good litmus test. Mm -hmm. Um, I also think, you know, the amount of res the, the amount of time you're spending together, I think is a decent litmus test. If you used to spend a lot of time together and enjoy that time and laugh and have a good time, and all of a sudden it's less and less and less, I think that's also a decent barometer of the fact that something might be coming between you. Um, if you find yourself complaining a lot to your friends and talking a lot about your relationship to your friends, you find yourself even feeling anxious a lot and feeling down and depressed and kind of disconnected. Oftentimes our primary relationship is the culprit, right? Because if, if typically when people feel happy and fulfilled in their primary relationships, they're better in the world, right? It's, it's the same thing like, an in, like a mother baby situation mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. if a baby feels safe in their relationship, mm -hmm. safely connected, <laughs> and they feel they can crawl up into mom's lap at any point in time. Um, they're more likely to be independent. They're more likely to be curious and open to new experiences than, than babies or children that are insecurely attached. And so I think it's the same thing. I know it's the same thing with couples. Mm -hmm. If you're not doing so well in your life and you're not sort of, um, you know, doing what you want to be doing and feeling successful and feeling, um, you know, uh, vital in the world, 
Mm -hmm. um, again, it might be a barometer of the fact that your primary relationship, that you don't feel a safe connection with your partner. I think the other thing I'd add to that list is how do you, how do you fight or how do you disagree? And if it is um, fairly hostile, if there's no repair after, if it's just like, let's just kind of forget it ever happened, mm -hmm. that, that's not a sustainable pattern of disagreeing. Right. Mm -hmm. So that, that I would say would be another red flag that it would be good to, to have somebody to support you making changes in that pattern. That's great. Yeah. Defensiveness, contempt. Um, John Gottman, who's a, an amazing researcher out of Seattle, talks, uh, talks about the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And the more he sees um, contempt, stonewalling, um, no, contempt, stonewalling, um, there's two others. <laughs> of course, we can't think of the, 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 uh, maybe defensiveness, I don't know, and one other. The mm -hmm. more he sees that in a couple, the higher the likelihood that the couple will be especially contempt and especially defensiveness. It's, 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 it's directly correlated with divorce, actually. And he can predict divorce rates up to like 92% accuracy. Amazing. Just from what he sees. So his books are amazing. He's written many, many books. John Gottman, he's amazing. And so exactly what you're saying, the more of those horsemen of the apocalypse that you're experiencing, that are hanging out in your, that are hanging out in your relationship when you don't get along, when you're not, you know, when you're disagreeing, the, 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 the bigger the red flag. But he also counters that with saying that what he feels is the biggest predictor of, of kind of success in, in a marriage or a relationship is what he calls your love map. How much do you know each other and do you strive to know each other and are you curious to know each other? And sometimes, ironically, it's during therapy where you begin expanding your love maps of each other. Okay. Yeah. Dang. So. And when you were talking about that, um, that reminded me of the, con the whole concept of love languages. And I'm, that was something that I learned about, again, just like when we were pretty much already in crisis mode. It was like, oh, maybe, you know, maybe this will be kind of that Hail Mary path. I'll get this book and we'll kind of work through this. And um, that was a fascinating, fascinating um, concept to talk or to, to learn about. And I was wondering if we could take just a couple of minutes. I'm assuming that both of you work with this in your practices and are intimately familiar with this and um, recognize the importance and help your clients incorporate this into their lives. Can you describe for our viewers and listeners who may not be aware of what the love languages are and the importance of them in a relationship? Mm -hmm. Um, I, I'll, I'll start out with an example before we kind of list what they are. Um, so my husband is very domestic and he, he <coughs> loves to be in the kitchen and he loves to, to kind of be in the home. And so he would do things like go and get, get groceries or get me um, a particular kind of fish I liked or whatever. And for a long time, I didn't see that as his love language. All I thought was that you're over-functioning. You're, you know, I feel guilty because I'm not buying groceries because I'd rather, you know, be writing a research paper than I would be doing anything domestic. And, and it took me a long time to realize that his gestures were his love language. His gestures and the fact that those gestures indicated that he saw me for who I was which is that I liked fish or I liked whatever. Mm -hmm. And so, and my love language is much more physical. I'm somebody who touches, who kisses. I always say the story, he has a, he's bald. And I always will go, even when I'm mad at him, I make a point of going over and holding his head and kissing it because that's my, that's my love language. He's not bald. He shaves his head. It's because a difference. He, because he's bald. <laughs> So what are the so, other love languages? I don't. So the other. Like five. So there's acts of service, yeah, which is so, which are which are your husband's. Yeah. There is, I think, physical. What is yeah. the touch? Yeah. There is gifts. So so material. So gifts like physical gifts. There is verbal love language, which yes. is hearing. I love you. You're so beautiful. Whatever it is. And, and there's quality time. Ah, and there's quality time. Right. Right, right. I think those are the five. Forgive us if we missed one. 
Um, and I don't want to make you feel like I'm giving you a quiz, but I just this topic is so fascinating, and I wanted to talk about those. And yeah, those are absolutely five. And I always I joke, but those are the five that I always talk about. But I add a six, and that's food. Like food is like a whole separate love language in my world. You walk yeah, in, that's my husband's. Walk into my house with panda brownies, like you got me hook, line, and sinker done. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's yeah. true food. Yeah. Yeah. The, they say the weight, of, the weight of the heart is through the stomach, right? Yeah, exactly. And I just thought this was such an important thing to talk about because again, this was something I wasn't even aware of until it was too late. And had I known this, had I been aware of this, and I had the same experience that you did, Pam, talking about the way that your husband was expressing love to you was you didn't recognize or realize that he was yep. actually, it was his language and that's very much how I felt I felt like we were both speaking different languages foreign languages to each other and we didn't understand and I remember I'll just share a personal example too I remember in one of our Christmases where the kids were young I think I had a four-year-old uh one-year-old and a newborn it was those days when I could barely even get out of my pajamas and I remember for one of the Christmases my husband had gotten me a really pretty diamond bracelet and I thought well it's gorgeous. Like I appreciate it. But my first thought was like, oh my God, like, where am I going to wear this? Like I, I could barely get out of my yoga pants, hoodie, no makeup, hair in a ponytail yeah. every day. And I remember, and he, so he was very much into gifts and in and my love languages were very different. And actually, and as we, and not to say I didn't appreciate it, it was very thoughtful, but I didn't recognize that the gifts were a way that he was trying to express his love. And all I would think of was like, what I really want you to do is like surprise me and come home from work or take a day off and just take the kids for three hours so I could get a nap. You know, I wanted that or I wanted physical affection. And actually, as we went through the book, The Five Love, love Languages, we were actually perfectly uncorrelated. Literally like, you know, his top one was my bottom one and my yeah. top one, vice versa. And again, had I known that, I know I would have done a lot of things differently over the years. So I just think that that's such an important concept for people to become aware of and learn if they're interested in investing in the relationship, learning to speak your partner's language is not just assuming that they give and receive love in the same way that we give and receive love. Exactly. And it's, it's part of the love map, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's part of knowing. And, it, and it's so, as you share that with me, and it's so frustrating because how many marriages are lost because had we just known this sooner, you know, I, 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 I get so angry and frustrated around that as well. I should, because it's not, this is stuff that we should be learning when we're growing up. This is stuff that they should be teaching in school. And I know that sounds out there, but I, I think skills to, to make it a relationship work would, would do, you know, would, would make happier people than teaching certain subjects that they teach in school. Yeah. That I are, mean, if that you think are, about having a high school on a high school subject, on, and it relationships and it doesn't just have to be love i mean no it doesn't have to be romantic relationships no. right relationships oh. with your friends right. it's the same it's relationships the same with people at work etc those yeah. right imagine it's how much really better the world would be functioning if people were happy and they're happier in their relationships right and absolutely and just learning how to speak and express your emotions and you know rather than you did it's i feel hurt when you do this, or I feel whatever, and it completely reframes it and helps the other person open up and just establishes a much healthier framework. So I do, I totally agree that I think that there is a lot that can be done in the way of making people aware of how to strengthen interpersonal relationships. Right, before it's too late, right? right. Keeping before. families together instead of pulling families apart when couples don't get along. I mean, that's what you really want. I think that's the sign of a healthy society is, is healthy families, you know? Right. I and the couple is the backbone of the family. Right. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So I feel frustrated and I'm sorry for that. I, I feel, you know, I'm sorry for that. And, and again, I think it's just, you know, I hate to say luck, but it's, a, it's frustrating that you didn't have that information before and, and none of us had that information before. It's, it's right. right. You know, and I have looked at that, I, you know, looked back on my life and had I known then what I know now, we could all say that about any situation. And I think what's most important is that we take what we know now and share that knowledge. We can only move forward. So yeah. I'm super excited to share what I've learned through my experience, through various other life experiences through just being in the world and, and being now committed to raising collective consciousness, 
I can only move forward. So we just take those life experiences and make us who we are and impart that knowledge on others. Yeah. Um, speaking of imparting knowledge, we are, um, we are about wrapped up. We're going to be wrapping up in just a couple minutes, but do you have any closing words of advice or anything else that you would like to share with our listeners or viewers before we wrap up? I, I would, I would say, you know, um, invest in your relationships. Uh, they're what make us happiest, not necessarily just romantic relationships, but all of people that are important to you invest in those relationships, be vulnerable, um, let other people know how you feel, let other people know what you need. Um, you know, uh, you know, you know, they talk about, um, the, Oh, what are they, you know, not taking things personally. One of the, um, the four, what do you call that? The four agreements. I don't know if you've ever read that, but the four agreements, try not to take things personally, try to be curious about yourself, move your ego out of the way, you know, kill off the ego. It's a good death. Um, all it does is typically stands in between yourself and the people who matter most to you. Yeah. Great. You, great. Thank you. Thank you. I think the investment is, is particularly true. And what we know is, and this is something to keep in mind as, as, as I get older and we all get older is that if there's research showing that um, longevity is, is, Close, healthy longevity is closely related to having those satisfying relationships in your life. So. Okay. Oh, interesting. It does yeah. make sense. I mean, overall, just well, but you're just overall happier, more relaxed, less stress. And I can see how that would contribute to longevity. Yeah. Well, yeah. Thank, thank you both for sharing that. Um, if people would like to get in contact with you directly, what is the best way to do that? Well, we have our Facebook um, page, which is a relationship. No, we have our website, which is relationshipdish.com. So you can go right. to our website and you can send us a message on our website. Yeah, it's actually dishers at relationshipdish.com. Oh, if they want to write us. Yeah. Yeah. If they want to write us, it's dishers at relationshipdish.com. If they just want to sort of look at us, about us, all our episodes live on um, Relationship Dish as, yeah. our, as our website. Okay. Um, also, they can uh, they can reach us on Twitter at, at uh, our Dishers podcast. Yeah, and we're on Instagram and we're on Facebook. Yeah, and Great. we have a hundred plus episodes on our on our uh, website on our website. Yeah, and we're on iTunes and and so yeah, it's it's hopefully it's hard not to find us. <laughs> <laughs> it's easy to find us. Great. Well, thank you so much. I so appreciate both of you being here um, and sharing all of your knowledge with us today on the show. I would also like to thank all of our viewers and listeners and also would like to invite you once again to join our Facebook community. We are at liveauthentically.today slash FB. Hope you all have a great day. Mm -hmm.